So I'm, a, I'm from Boston originally, and uh, my parents are from Haiti in the Caribbean. So I was, I was a first generation American. Any first generation Americans here? Yeah. You ever watched the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding? Anybody ever seen that? I watched that movie and I was like, oh, that's my entire life right here. So, uh, man, I'm so pumped to, to be able to hang out with you guys tonight. Uh, on behalf of my senior pastor, Ray Johnson, and the entire Bayside family across our six campuses, uh, we just love to hear what God's doing here in the region and through you guys and through this church. So on behalf of Pastor Ray, uh, thank you so much for having me here. Tyler was here last weekend, uh, the good-looking white boy. Do you guys like, was Tyler good last week? Yeah, I, I love Tyler, glad that he's on staff uh, with us. And um, uh, my wife couldn't come tonight. Uh, she's at home with our two daughters. They are a hot mess. So she's hanging out with them right now. But we love our two little girls. Georgia is six years, well, she'll be six in a couple of weeks, and Ruby will be three, just turned three back in May. So I love them so very much. Uh, so they send their, their greetings also. Um, I know you guys are in a series um, called, uh, uh, it's behind me, so I'll just read it, Greater Than Gold. Um, and as I was kind of praying through this and saying, hey, God, what's, what's a word that you have for me to speak to this, uh, to this awesome group? Uh, God just really impressed a, a word on my heart that I'd love to share with you guys uh, tonight. And, and I'm thank you so much, um, Ed and Peter and Nikita, who's not here tonight, just for your graciousness, for the graciousness of this church. And I love the heartbeat of Bright being a church that's a praying church. So before we go, before we hear from God and his words, because I don't want tonight to be about my words, but about the words of God, uh, would you guys just we'll stand again together and just ask the spirit of God to speak loudly. Uh, Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for this church. I thank you for the leadership of this church, Lord Jesus. I thank you for every young person in this space tonight. And God, I just pray right now, Lord God, that your countenance would be upon me, Lord God, that it would be your words and not my words, Father Jesus. And I pray that you would speak loudly. Lord God, we know the words from your lips are sweeter than honey, more precious than gold. And I pray tonight, Lord Jesus, that we would receive those words, the deep wisdom found in your word, and that it would penetrate our hearts, transform our minds, and renew our spirits to be deeper and closer to you. We love you. We thank you in Christ's name. All God's people said, amen. amen. You go ahead, be seated. Any animal lovers in the house? Any animal lovers? You know, animals are very weird to me uh, because uh, they're, not, they're not furniture, but they're not people. So I don't know what to do with animals. You know what I mean? It's like, do I put my feet on you? Do I walk? You know, it's, it's, it's very interesting. But as I've gotten, my wife's a big animal lover. So as I've gotten to, you know, uh, uh, share in some of her passions, we will watch like these animal shows together. You guys ever watch any of these animal shows like Shark Week and different stuff on, Na on National Geographic? And I'm watching this one uh, uh, expose that they're doing on lions. And as I'm watching this, I kind of just get totally enthralled and totally like just pulled in to this little segment that they're doing on lions. Now, you know a little bit about lions. Lions are, are like the, the, they call them apex predator, so that the very top of the food chain in, in, in the jungle. And specifically the male lion. The male lion, will, you will know who's the, the leader or the king of the pride, uh, you know, kind of like Mufasa in, uh, in uh, Lion King, you know. So, like, you know who the king of the pride is. Uh, the pride's the group of animals, the group of lions all together. And, and you'll see this lion, one very strong, uh, one very mighty lion, and he'll have this mane, just the hair that flows around him. And this lion will, wherever he goes, you'll see the lioness, the female lions kind of following him, following behind him. You'll see the lion cubs kind of looking towards him. This, this, the king of the, of, the, of the tribe, the king of the pride, will often have these just very long nails as he is the apex predator. He's the one that's going to go after and lead in the hunt. He'll have these long, long, sharp teeth as he leads the group together. But as I was watching this, the narrative started really talking about some intricate parts of the lion life that I didn't know. You see, what will happen is 
that lion, the, 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 the leader of the pack, as he gets older, his mane will start to wither and fall away. And, and the sharp nails on his paw, those claws will start to dull. And the, the, the mighty teeth in his mouth will actually fall out. But one thing stays the same. One thing remains with this lion. One thing remains with this king of the jungle is his roar. You see, the lion will still roar and everyone in the jungle will remember that roar. And every time they hear that roar, they will remember the fury, they will remember the greatness, they will remember the fear that that lion put in their heart. So lions are very keen animals. So what they'll do actually is, even though that the king... The, 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 the leader of the pack is getting old and doesn't have any teeth in his mouth. He'll stand at one end of the savannah and he will let out a roar. And he'll look for a gazelle or a zebra that's fallen away from the pack. You got to remember that. That's fallen away from the pack. And, and once he has that gazelle or zebra in his sights, he will let out this roar as he's at one end, end of the savannah. And instinctually, that zebra or that gazelle will hear that roar, and instead of heading towards it, they remember, they remember the power of that lion. They remember seeing that lion kill before, and they'll turn and run in the other direction. What they don't realize is, in the savannah, under the high grass, the lioness and the younger lions are waiting. And the instant the gazelle or zebra runs in that direction, they will jump out, pounce on them, and devour them. Nature's pretty cool. And as I'm watching that, I sit on my couch and I go, that's me. I'm that zebra, I'm that gazelle. You see, I'll be walking my walk with Christ. I'll be doing my thing for Jesus, getting my life figured out, and then I'll hear this roar, this roar of my past, this roar of things that I've done that I can't explain, this roar of my heart that wasn't repentant, and I'll hear the roar, and instead of running towards the roar, I will turn away back to my old life, back to my old friends, back to my old relationships where I think I'm safe, but actually destruction is waiting and lying to devour me. If I was going to put tonight's message greater than gold in one sentence, it would be this sentence. It would be, Run towards the roar. See, if that gazelle or zebra knew that that fear that they had had no power over them, had no control over them, had no dominion any longer over them, they would run right at that lion. And he would be helpless to hurt them. And that's what the, the enemy does, friends. The enemy wants to fool you and trick you with the fear of your past, the fear of your inadequacies, the fear of not being enough, and makes you turn from the way you should be going into danger. And I believe for this generation, the biggest roar the biggest roar that the enemy, the biggest lie that the enemy is telling this generation, your generation, is you can do life alone. It's the biggest lie that I believe that this generation is buying into. The idea that you can do life alone. That you are enough. 
that you have the power, the intelligence, the heart to do this life on your own. My friends, that is a deep, deep fallacy. The roaring lion of fear tells us that we will never be truly known, that we should never be truly known. That's why so many of us feel more comfortable living in this world than this world. That's why at church, come on somebody, that's why at church, ready, look around the room. Look around. I want you to look around. You've probably sat in that same seat, I don't know, since you first started coming to Bright. There's this uncomfortability about us that says, I don't want to get near people because if I get near people, they're going to know my stuff. They're going to know my junk. They're going to know I'm not as cool as I pretend to be. When I was walking in here, one of the young ladies at the door greeting so kindly looked at me and said, oh my gosh, you're such a hipster. Look how you dress. Friends, I am old. When I left the house, my wife said, what are you wearing? I said, I'm going to talk to young people, so I'm going to look young tonight. But there's something about us that doesn't want to cross that line. Okay. You guys seem like friends. I grew up in a Baptist church. I was telling these guys so much like this. So this, this feels like home to me. Maybe I'm the first black Russian you've ever met, but like... Um, <laughs> This feels very comfortable for me. Um, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get like, let's get like some practical application before I even get into God's word with this message. It, is it okay if we get a little honest in here? Come on. If you're new, this might be weird for you, so go ahead and uh, send your complaints to Peter and Ed. They can handle that. But I want everybody to stand one more time. Stand one more time. Grab your stuff too. I'm not going to pray. We just want you to stand. Ready? If you're in the back, the cheap seats, you don't get extra money for being back there. I want everybody to come close. Come on, we're going to fill in the front right here. Get out, get, move, move where you're going. We're going to come. Because this, this message is about being together. So I want us to be together. I want you to fill these first couple of rows right here. Look at you. Some of you don't even know what you're doing. Some of you are thinking you're just going to go home. They're like, I don't know what this guy wants. Why does he want to say, I don't sit here. This ain't my seat. No one still wants to come to the front. Hey, I'm going to give a free shirt. I'm going to give one of uh, Peter's $20 shirts to the people who fill in this section right here. Come on, here we go. Yeah, we're going to get together. Look, other people are like, I'll just move one row ahead. I see you boys back there. I see you young men. Come on, come on. Good. Awesome. Awesome. Better together. Come on, you can keep coming. These guys just move one row. You're not fooling me. All right, I've been doing ministry for 16 years. I know. Good. Man. Now ready? Now ready. If, if you've been coming to Bright for some years now, Ready, look around, look around, look around, look around, real quick, look around. See the difference? See the difference? Here, here's the difference. Ready, give me your eyes, I want you to get this. You're better together. See now, if I walked in here, if I walked in here my first time, my first impression, and I saw this, you know I would say? Wow, look at this group of young, this congregation of young Russian men and women, Eastern, Eastern European men and women, look at them, loving Jesus together in the middle of Sacramento at 8.30 on a Sunday night where you could be doing anything else, you're coming to church. This is encouraging. But you know what? Everything inside of you, some of you, you got sweaty palms right now. Your stomach's all, because a wall's been broken down. I'll tell you this, if you want to write something down, write this down, ready? If you're 99% known, you're 100% unknown. If you're 99% known, you're 100% unknown. If you allow people just to see a piece of you or part of you, but they can't see the whole of you, then they've really seen none of you. And I believe 
that our, our eternal, our eternal fraternity, our eternal sisterhood, our eternal connection with God is a corporate undertaking. I believe we accept Jesus Christ personally, but I believe our, our formation as men and women of Jesus Christ is a corporate undertaking. And you know what Jesus, you know what God did to make sure that we would reach the end of our race? What God gave us, he gave us each other. Read with me this passage from Hebrews chapter 9, excuse me, chapter 3, verse 12. It says this, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has sinful, unbelieving hearts that turn away from the living God. But, if you've got a Bible, I want you to underline this and circle it. But, encouraging one another daily as long as it's called today. Encouraging each other daily as long as it's called today. Today, that's the gold right there. So that none of you may be hardened by the sinful deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ. If indeed we hold our original convictions firmly to the very end. You have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly to the end the confidence we had at first. You know how you hold firm to the end? By holding on to the person next to you. By holding on to the brother or sister in Christ next to you. A message for you guys tonight is about Christian camaraderie, Christian fellowship, Christian brotherhood, Christian sisterhood, the body of Christ bound together. Because everywhere else you go in this world, it's going to tell you, do it alone. But when it comes to Jesus Christ, when it comes to the church of Jesus Christ, Jesus says, we are better together. And as I look over scripture, looking for this gold, looking for this deep wisdom, I was drawn to the life of David, King David. King David, you know him throughout the scripture. Uh, he's, the, he's the one who killed Goliath. Uh, he's anointed by Samuel, uh, the priest. He, he was uh, the leader and the king uh, of the early virgining Israel nation. Waged wars, won wars, was a, a man after God's own heart, scripture tells us. And we know about the greatness of David. But David would not have been the man that he was, was it not for the men that were around him? David would not become the man that he was, the man that we read in Scripture, without the men around him. And the same is true for each and every one of us. No matter what platform you're on, remember, you are always standing on someone else's shoulders. The only reason I'm here, right, you guys have never heard of me, I'm a nobody. But the reason I'm here is because I stand on the shoulders of my senior pastor. And because God put a vision in his heart and his wife's heart, and they planted this church 23 years ago, and now the church has, has, has reached far and wide across this valley, across this state, uh, across this nation. So now... When Nikita and the guys come to a conference at our church and they hear me speak because my senior pastor allowed me to speak at this conference and then they're like, hey, Carl, why don't you come in and invite me to come here? See, I am wise enough to know I stand on someone else's shoulders. And as we see David, it's knowing and understanding that David is standing on others' shoulders. The person particularly is Jonathan. Jonathan the son of Saul, David's predecessor. And tonight I want to look at four lessons that we can learn from the life, from the, from the relationship between David and Jonathan, that if we put these into practice in our life, it'll help us to run towards the roar confidently. And that wisdom is greater than gold. 
I'll read the scripture first and then we'll go back and we'll dissect it together. Give you a little bit of context. What's happening here is David has now really come to the front, forefront of visibility and popularity among God's people, among the nation of Israel. He goes to battle. He, he's the young man that killed the Philistine giant, Goliath. And people have heard about him. People are, are cheering for him. There's actually a part where David enters in to the capital of Jerusalem. And as David's coming in out of battle, people start to chant this song. And, and Saul's coming in first. And, excuse me, Saul comes in second, David coming in first. And as David's coming in, riding in on his chariot, people are singing this song that goes something like this. You know, Saul's killed thousands, but David has killed tens of thousands. They're celebrating his military prowess. They're like, this is the leader. Now, I wonder if you are the actual leader and everybody's saying this other guy is better than you and that he should be king. So Saul, who's known to be hot-tempered, says he's going to kill David. So David fearfully with about 600 of his men, head into the wilderness, head into the desert to avoid death. That's where we pick up. 1 Samuel chapter 23. It reads like this. While David was in Horesh, in, de in the desert of Zeth, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. And Saul's son Jonathan went to David in Horesh. And helped him find strength in God. If you are writing, and I want you to underline that, that line, writing your scripture. And David at Horesh, and he helped him find strength in God. Jonathan said, do not be afraid. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel, and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. The two of them made a covenant before the Lord. Then Jonathan went home, but David remained in Horesh. Four lessons when he's talking about strengthening each other, bounding each other together. Lesson number one, Christians need clusters. Christians need clusters. Verse 15 says, while... David, you can put, keep, keep the scripture up. David says, while David was in Horesh in the desert in Zeth, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life and Saul's son, Jonathan. And Saul's son, Jonathan. You see, Jonathan had committed to David as a friend. Jonathan was going to be there for David. As a friend. I want to get this out of the way really quick and I'll repeat it at the end of my message. I'm not saying that Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, shouldn't have non-believers friends. Our call is to go into the world, into the very parts of the world, like this trip team that's going to Uganda tomorrow, going to the very ends of the world to bring the truth, the light, the grace, the love of Jesus Christ. But your inner circle, the people you're closest to, this is the gold. Ready? should be followers of Jesus Christ alike. Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, little Christ, we need clusters. And it doesn't matter if you are the deepest Christian in here. It doesn't matter if you have memorized every book of the Bible. It doesn't matter if you're the most spiritual person around. Even heavyweights in faith need other Christians to rely on. Charles Spurgeon a great theologian, one of the greatest thinkers of the 20th century when it comes to Christian thought and theology and doctrine. Listen to what he wrote at one instance in his life. This is from his autobiography, Charles Spurgeon. He's, this, is, this is Billy Graham times 100. Okay? Charles Spurgeon wrote this. Some years ago, I was subject of fearful depression of spirit. Various troublesome events had happened to me, and I was so unwell, my heart sank within me. Out of the depths, I was forced to cry out to the Lord. Just before I went away to, Monti uh, to, excuse me, to Mentone, 
for rest. I suffered greatly in the body, for I fear, excuse me, for but far more in the soul. For my spirit was overwhelmed under the pressure. I preached a sermon from the words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I was as much unqualified to preach from that text as ever I expected to be. Indeed, I hope that a few of my brethren could have entered so deeply into this heartbreaking words. I felt to the full of my measure the horror of a soul forsaken of God. Now that was not a desirable experience. I tremble at the bare idea of passing through the ellipse of the soul again. I pray that I may never suffer in that fashion again. Even this titan of faith had moments where he felt weak, where he felt alone, where he needed a Jonathan, he needed a brother in Christ to come alongside of him. Have you ever been in a season in your life where you needed a friend? Have you ever been in a season in your life where you needed help? I remember as a little kid, I have, I have, I have seven siblings. I'm the second youngest out of seven kids. And, and I wasn't always this rotund at one point in my life. I was a really skinny little thing. Uh, but I have always had a big mouth. I've always liked to talk a lot. So I remember like being in our neighborhood in Boston, and, and, I, and I would go up to anybody, and I'd just start running my mouth. Oh, man, you can't do this. Oh, you can't do that. I'd just, just getting up in people's face, just saying all types of crazy stuff. And, and you know why I did that? It's because I knew I had six big brothers who could kick anybody's butt. And I had a big sister who could kick their butt. So you got to imagine the strength that she had. You see, I knew what it was like to have a, a squad, to have a, a, a group, to have some people with me that would have my back. In this difficult time in David's life, he knew he had that. The question I ask you, Who's your cluster? Who's your inner circle? Point number two, friendship takes conscious effort. Friendship takes conscious effort. See, the second lesson is that strengthening a person's hand in God involves conscious effort. It involves intentionality. You don't just do it on the fly. Ready? Listen, you can't just be a good friend on the fly. There's got to be an intentionality about it. There's got to be intentionality about helping those in your circle. Verse 16, it says, Jonathan saw son rose and went. He went to David. Jonathan is the prince of the nation. His father's the king. Jonathan could have sent word. He could have sent a messenger. He could have sent supplies. He could have sent men. He could have sent people. But what does he do? He rises up from his palace, from his seat of position, and he goes to David. There is this intentionality about it. It was purposeful, it was planned, it was intentional, it was with a, a singular thought. Here is my friend in need, I am going to go and help him. We would plan to strengthen, do we plan to strengthen each other's hands in God? When you get up in the morning, as a follower of Jesus Christ, before you ask for your daily bread, before you ask for God's provisions on your life, do you ask God, God, who can I encourage today? God, who can I bring favor upon today? God, who can I be kind to today? God, who of those you have put around me can I come alongside and remind them of who they are in you? 
The mark of Christian maturity is that you would build into the life of others with deep intention. See, that's how I can tell a mature Christian from somebody just playing the game. It, it, it's someone who's purposely building into the life of others. One of our pastors is here with us, here with me tonight, Shane. I've seen this lesson in Shane so constantly where he's intentionally building into others. That's what real friends do. That's what, Dave, that's what Jonathan did for David. Are you entering this week with a plan for your cluster? A committed, intentional idea of how you want to help them, how you want to encourage them. It's a text message. It's a pat on the back. It's a letter in the mail, a phone call. Let me tell you something. If you picked up your phone tomorrow and called one of your friends and just said, hey, I want you to know this morning you are loved and favored by God. Go have a good day. Do you know what that could do for the spirit and the countenance of that person? Now, now you're, some of you dudes are sitting in here and you're like, I'm not calling anybody tomorrow. <laughs> I'm going to send a text message. Gosh, you know, um, again, this is, the world tells us to live here. There is nothing more. There are things that are more, you know, non-personal. But it's hard for me to find things that are more non-personal than text messages. And now we've become such a lazy society, now you don't even have to reply to people. You can just choose an option that says, ha, 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 thumbs up, thumbs down, exclamation point. What does that mean? Right? I'll, I'll be pouring my guts out to somebody on text message, and I get a thumbs up. Like, what? Oh, man, my dog just died. Thumbs down. That's not intentional living. I ask you this question. Are you daily making time to build into others? Are you making time daily to build into others? Number three, friendship is strengthening each other's hands in God. The thrust, the, the, the rue of this message. Friendship, real friendship is strengthening each other's hands in God. The strength we are giving each other isn't our strength, but in fact, strength in God. This is the paradox of Christianity. This is the paradox of Christianity. Understand this? Where it's like, yeah, I, I, I want to be close to people. I want people to know that they can rely on me. But if I am a true friend, when I'm giving them the information, when I'm giving them the, the, the thought process, when I'm giving them the, the truth that they can rely on me, what I'm really saying is, are you dependent not on me, but on God? That's what a real friend does. A real friend is pointing his friend his co-laborer, his brother, his sister in Christ is pointing them to a deeper relationship with God. That's the difference between Christianity and all those other things like a self-help group, a support group, therapy group, you know, self-help books. The whole point of Christian clusters, of Christians groups is to draw each other to Christ and not man and not self. Can I get an Amen. Do you draw others to depend on God? Do you draw others to depend on God? Uganda team, listen, when you're in Uganda, your goal is not to get people to depend on the friendly Americans that came with the stuff. Your goal is not even to get them to depend on the bread that you're going to Give them when you build these ovens for them to cook bread. Your goal is to get them to depend on Christ Jesus. That's your goal. 
and through love, through community, through fellowship, you're going to say, the only reason I would get on a plane and fly, you know, 12 hours from Sacramento, California to Uganda is because Jesus is living in me and I'm dependent on him and you should be dependent on him. So one day you can get on a plane and you can fly to other sides of this nation and bring the good news, living bread, living water. That's your dependence. A real friend draws you to Jesus. If you know someone in your life, come on somebody, that every time around them, you are drained. Anybody have a friend like that? I got a friend, oh man, when this dude calls me, I love him. I love him, but when he calls me, I gotta pray to Jesus first. Oh Jesus, give me strength. Because my man drains me. He drains me, but we're praying for Shane. No, I'm kidding. It's not Shane, right? <laughs> but I want to be surrounded by people that bring me to living water, that bring me to refreshment, that bring me to edification. You draw others to depend on Jesus. Four, and lastly, friends help friends. Friends help friends rehearse God's faithfulness. Your inner circle will help you rehearse God's faithfulness. Verse 17, what is Jonathan's reply to David? He says, fear not for the hand of Saul, my father shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel and I shall be where? Not in front of you, not behind you, but where a friend should be. Next to you. Saul, my father, also knows this. You see, David and Jonathan were close. They were close for some time. And, and I believe that there would have been a time in their relationship. This isn't recorded in scripture. But there would have been a time in their relationship where David would have told him about a day where he was out tending his father's flock. And a wise man, a known man, came to his father's house. And told his father, Jesse, I am looking for one of your sons. God's favor and anointing and blessing is on one of your sons. And Jesse, David's father, lines up all of his boys, big, strong, tall in stature. And he looks at them one at a time. Not you, not you, not you, not you, not you, not you. Do you have any more sons? And Jesse says, yeah. The youngest, the boy, he's out in the field tending the flock. And the prophet goes out and he finds David. And he looks at him and he says, this is God's man. This is God's man. And he anoints him with oil and he tells him, God has placed you in the seat of favor and you will be king. Not now, but you will be king. And here's David running from the king He's hiding in the desert, and he's wondering, oh, my goodness, do I still got God's favor? Is God still with me? Oh, my Lord, where are you? And it takes a friend to come up and say, David, let's remember God's faithfulness. David, remember when everyone else was afraid of Goliath? You said, how dare this Philistine Speak against my God and my people. Remember when my father gave you his armor and you said, I don't need this armor for I have God with me. Remember when you took, they took the sword and they gave you the sword. You said, I don't need the sword. I'm going to go with a few smooth stones and a sling. Remember when that giant fell to the ground and you lifted up his sword above your head and you cut his head off. Remember God was with you in that situation. Do you have a friend that's going to tell you, remember when you were addicted and you found Jesus? Remember when you were in that broken relationship and you were strong enough to leave? Remember when your parents and you couldn't get along and God restored that relationship? Remember when you'd have a job? Remember when school was tough? Remember those moments where you looked up, where you cried out, God, I need help. God, I need you. And he responded. A 
real friend will help you rehearse God's faithfulness. Will remind you of your purpose, your calling. Jonathan strengthened David's hand in God by reminding him of his destiny and his purpose in God. Who have you done deep life with? Who knows the darkest parts of you, the brightest parts of you, the broken parts of you? If you want wisdom that's greater than gold, here's my challenge for you. Be known. Be known. And and listen, I'm not telling you that everybody's got to know everything about you. Everybody's got to know all your business. But somebody's got to know some of it. I'm not saying that all your friends need to be Christians and you need to be holy rollers running around thumping people over the head with the Bible, but you've got to have people that you can go to God with, that it's more, it's more, it's more than just talking about the NBA finals. It's more than talking about uh, what show, what show you're binge watching on, on uh, Netflix. It's got to be more about than complaining about your parents. You, somebody's got to know you. That was a relationship from David and Jonathan. real friend, a God-honoring friend is going to be there in the moments where you're weakest, where you're the most tired, where you're the most vulnerable. Because you know what happens in those moments? You're your true self. Friends, listen, as the guy up on the pulpit sweating a lot, this isn't my true self. Understand this, this isn't my true self. This is my calling, this is my purpose, this is who I am. This is my, not my true self. You know what my true self is? When I get home in, a, in about an hour or so, when I get home and I take off these tight jeans <laughs> and, and my daughter comes out of her room for the fourth time tonight and me and my wife are in sweatpants and we're watching HGTV and, and I got my arm around my wife and we're eating too much ice cream. That's my true self. Because you know, in that space, I am 100% known. Maybe you're not married yet, maybe. So who's that person for you? That's gonna see you in the weakest parts of your life. It's gonna see you in the most broken parts of your life and hold you up. saw this video and it just like helped really cap this idea for me of what real friendship looks like. I'll set it up for you a little bit. There's these two brothers that are both elite long distance runners and they're running in this race. One of them is a Olympian and they're running in this race for Great Britain and they're in the final few steps, the final few yards of this race, and then this happens. Check this out. Just let me show the video. There you go. Oh, and he's starting to slow, and there is a little way to go. There's half a K to go. He's losing his sense of direction. This is worrying. Jonathan Brownlee has lost it now and has staggered to a stop at the side of the course and Alistair's stopped to help him along and Alistair is going to try and carry his brother home as the Olympic champion carries his younger brother towards the podium. Matt, is this allowed? Is he allowed to help his brother? You know, is that part of the rules? I'm not too sure. We've never seen anything like this before. To finish in second and third but Johnny can hardly stand and Alistair is having to drag him across the line and pushing him home, pushing him home for second. Johnny finishes in second. Goodness me, what an incredible conclusion here. Now you gotta catch this. This makes sense. Jonathan is weak, 
He's tired, doesn't know where he is. He's hit that virtual wall. And he's, as he begins to stumble, as he begins to lose his legs and, and know where he is, what happens? First, he kind of leans over to a stranger, and the stranger kind of helps him up. That's what we're supposed to do. You, you see somebody in need, you kind of just you kind of help just, just get them up. But then his brother comes, a, a, a comrade, someone who is near and close to him, and Alistair, the more elite of the two runners, puts his brother's arm around him and carries him. Now, here's the thing. Friends, if you're a brother, that's what you're supposed to do. There's nothing spectacular yet. That's your job. If there's somebody in this room that's struggling, your job is to pick them up, to put their arm around you and say, let's go. But here's the beauty of that story. The more elite runner, the stronger of the two, when they get to the finish line, what does he do? pushes his brother over the line first. He pushes him into the higher seat of favor. That's sacrifice. That's love. That is wisdom greater than gold. Do you have somebody in your life that will push you when you're weak, when you're tired, when you're broken, that will push you into the seat of favor, that will push you into victory, that will push you into that next chapter of your life. If you don't, I want to challenge you to do a practical test this week, and I'm going to end with this. I challenge you this week to do a personal inventory. Do a personal inventory of your relationships. And think about that picture that you saw. Think about this scripture that we read tonight. Think about David and Jonathan and the idea that he's standing on someone's shoulders to get where he needs to get. And ask yourself that question. Do the people on this list, not, not just regular friends, again, have all the friends you want, but the people in my inner circle, the people nearest to me, would they do these things for me? Would I do these things for them? And I want you to do three practical things this week. First, calculate. Calculate, would they do this for me? Would I do this for them? And if the answer is no, I want to challenge you to collect. Collect people in your life that would strengthen your hand in God. And this is the toughest one that you got to do. Cut. Cut the people out of your inner circle that aren't doing that for you. Calculate, collect, cut. Knowing that you have friends that will strengthen you in God, that will draw you nearer to God to find your purpose in him. Would you stand with me? As the worship band comes up and we continue in worship, I want to read a prayer over you. A prayer of unity, a prayer of togetherness. And I pray that you would allow these words, the words of the Apostle Paul, to wash over you, to encourage you, to help you calculate, to help you confidently say, I have people that will do this for me, that I will do this for. I have brothers and sisters that will strengthen my hand in God. Let the words of the Apostle Paul be our prayer tonight. This is Paul's prayer. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and in earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with the power through the Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, and how high, and how deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love with, that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. 
Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all the generations, forever and ever. Amen.